All right, so in last, last semester, I ended up getting the first week as well, and that wasn't planned for this week, but that's just how it worked out. But, and I had, so I had the introduction to the, ver, to the first chapter of Romans in the whole book. And I started, one of the things that I said at that time was that the book of Romans is a masterpiece. And it really truly is. It clearly lays out the gospel. Um, it tells us how to be saved and then how to live in the light of that. And we spent last semester going through chapters one through eight and of this letter. And if you weren't with us last semester, and I think all of you guys were, but if you weren't or you haven't in a while, even if you were, I would recommend taking some time to read through the entire book in one setting. The reason is because it's a letter. You know, if, if somebody wrote you a letter, you wouldn't read a little bit, walk away from it, come back and read it, you know, over a, a period of time. Um, but after you read the whole thing, you might go back and read parts of it. And so that's what we're doing with this letter. And the reason that we're doing it this way is it causes us to slow down. It causes us to have an opportunity to go a little bit deeper and to have the Holy Spirit an opportunity to speak to us and teach, to, teach us as we study. Now, in chapters 1 through 7 of Romans, Paul begins with God's judgment and wrath. Um, he tells us that we're worthy of death and our heritage which is, you know, who our parents are, who our grandparents are, um, are isn't going to be able to save us. Uh, he goes in, on to say that it's not because of what we've done. It's not our works that's able to save us. It's not being religious, you know, being a good person, showing up to church. Um, nothing can make us right with God. And so we are utterly helpless, and our need is great. And then Paul goes to chapter 8. So you've made it through 1 through 7, the hard part, and you get to chapter 8, and he talks about God's grace. There's nothing that we can do to earn heaven, but there is something that God has already done through Jesus to redeem us. And he begins chapter 8 with, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But you'll notice that that verse has a condition, right? It says, for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, it's for those who, are, who have placed their faith in the redeeming work of Jesus. It's those who have given their life to Jesus. Those for, are the ones for whom there is now no condemnation. So right when we were at the edge of, this, of despair, the end of chapter 7, due to our sin and our inability to save ourselves, Paul tells us about God's saving grace, and he begins reciting blessings for those who are in Christ, such as the fact that we have been set free. We can walk in peace when we set our minds on the Spirit. We are sons and daughters of God when we're led by the Spirit. And if God is for us, who can be against us? And nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Then there's another shift, kind of beginning in chapter 9. And Paul deals with the problem associated with the condition of Israel. Um, they had, for the most part, missed their Messiah, right? A question we might ask then is, if God's chosen people miss their Messiah, what hope do the rest of us have? Um, was God not clear? Was he unable to communicate properly his plan? Was he unable to actually save his people? So therefore, Paul turns his focus onto God's sovereignty and God's plan for the Jews and for the Gentiles. Remember um, Romans 8, 28 and 29. It says, And for we know that, those who that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be firstborn among many brothers. So there he's already hinting at this concept of predestination, predestined. Um, but the point of it is God has a plan for each of our lives. God has a purpose in history. Paul's going to talk more about this um, from chapter 9 all the way to chapter 11, and he's going to be using Israel as an example. So let's start at the beginning of chapter 9 in Romans, and we're going to start, I'm going to start with verse 1. He says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Paul had a deep love for his people, Israel. 
I mean, he was born and raised a Jew, right? He considered them, and they were, rightly so, his earthly family. And I know you looked at this as if you did the study questions this week, but we even, even though Paul was repeatedly mistreated at the hands of the Jews, he still loved them, right? They were still his people. I mean, he was born and raised a Jew. He was a Jew of Jews. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth, eighth day. He was very zealous for what he thought the Lord wanted him to do. So he understood as much as anybody else, and probably more so, the condition of the Jews, of God's people. Now, Christianity began as a sect of Judaism. So all of those, or at least the vast majority, at the beginning of the church who followed Jew Jesus were Jewish. Jesus was Jewish, and he came first to his own people. However, there's a demographic shift kind of by the time that Paul's writing this letter. Israel as a nation, and we're not talking about specific individuals, we're just talking about Israel as a nation, had rejected Christ for the most part. And so the majority of Christians now are Gentiles. Paul's sorrow is over the fact that he loves his people, but they don't believe in Jesus. They've rejected the Messiah that had been, to, been sent to, to redeem them from their sins. And I think about that. You know, chapter 8, he's talking about grace that's available and the benefits that come. And then it's almost like, but you're missing it. And that breaks my heart. I mean, he's very anguished. And it's interesting to me, I think, you know, at the beginning, he's so adamant. I'm telling the truth. The Holy Spirit is my witness. He's so adamant about the fact. I think part of the reason is because when it came to ministry, the Jews were his worst enemies. I mean, they had harassed and persecuted him, um, following him from town to town, stirring up violence and lies against him. I mean, it would have been easy to walk away um, without another thought toward them. But his passion was real. In verses 4 and 5, then, Paul lists some of the advantages they'd just been given by the fact that they were Jewish, they were born Jewish. The first one he lists is adoption. God had chosen Israel. No other nation was chosen by God. When God was calling Moses to Egypt to free the Hebrew slaves, he said, You shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And that's from Exodus 4.22. Israel was given a privilege that no other nation had been given. Then Paul reminded them of the glory. The glory was the presence of the Lord. Remember that Shekinah glory that appeared as a cloud by day and fire by night while they were in the wilderness that led them? Remember when the glory of the Lord filled the temple, when they dedicated the temple? Israel was the only nation that was led by God's presence in that way. Then he wrote about the covenants. There was the covenant that God made with Abraham to give him more descendants than he could count, even though he was old and he was married to a wife who was barren. He also promised to give them a land of their own, and he made a covenant with David that the Messiah would come from his line. They also received the law through Moses. You know, the Bible is a Jewish book. There's only two Gentile books, Luke and Acts. And so this was God's revelation to the Jews. The next thing that's listed is the worship, or some versions might say are the service. Um, it's talking about the service that took place in the temple that was given to the Jews to be able to worship God, to have fellowship with God, to be with God. And then he lists the promises. God promised them a land. God promised them an eternal kingdom. And he promised them a Messiah. You know, Israel was a tiny nation. And over the years, even up till you know, in recent times, they've endured much persecution in their history, right? And there was a time when they didn't have a land of their own. But because of God's promises to Israel, there is now a nation called Israel. There is a land and there is a people. Israel also had the fathers or the patriarchs. He's talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. God chose Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees. Abraham was a Gentile, right? He was the first Hebrew. So God promised to make a great nation from him. And we know that this was a promise that only God could deliver. Why? Because Abraham was 75 years old when he was called. He didn't have a child right away. Um, his wife was barren. So we have an old man, an old woman, no children. But God promised them descendants and promised that they would become a great nation. And God delivered on his promise. He gave them Isaac, and from Isaac came Jacob, and from Jacob came the 12 tribes. The tribes, remember, they went into Egypt. Eventually, they became slaves. Um, they were freed. They made it to the promised land. But 
on down the line, they were taken captive, but God preserved a remnant. And today there's over 6 million Jews living in Israel. So God kept his promise to Abraham. And the last promise that Paul lists is the best one of all. From the Jews came the Messiah. Jesus was a Jewish man. However, this Jewish man was also God in the flesh. Paul is making a clear statement here that Jesus is God and that God gave him to and through his chosen people, Israel. So God has made and, and kept promises to the Jews. He chose them. He was faithful to them, even when they weren't faithful to him. And, and I just think that should fill us with, with trust and joy, you know, because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's a promise-keeping God. And just seeing the promises that he kept for the nation of Israel, knowing that they were unfaithful in their history, he kept them anyway. So we can trust that God will keep his promises to us. Let's look at the chapter again, starting with verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has, has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all, who, not all are children of Abraham because they're his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. So it seems like Paul's anticipating a question you know, from someone who might say, well, God's word sure didn't come through for Israel, right? Um, uh, he didn't fulfill his promise. I mean, they missed their Messiah. They, you know, how do I know he's going to come through for me? And so Paul is addressing this. He tells them, no, the word of God has not failed. And the reason he can say that is because some Jews did believe, right? Not all of them rejected. And those who did are a part of God's remnant. You may remember, like all throughout the Old Testament, that any time that God allowed the Jews to be disciplined um, for their sin, you know, by wars or captivity or whatever it is, he never destroyed them completely, right? He always left a remnant of those who would follow him. So just because the majority of the Jews rejected Jesus, that doesn't mean that God's word failed. God's promise was still in effect for the minority of those who did believe and received the promise of God. So then Paul says, okay, not all who descended from Israel belong to Israel. And you're like, wait, what? That doesn't even make sense. But remember that Israel was the name that God had given to Jacob, remember? And one meaning of the name Israel is governed by God. So even though all the Jews were descendants of Israel, physically speaking, not all of them were governed by God because by their own choice, they rejected God. And it's similar kind of today how we use the word Christian, right? Not everyone who's, who's called a Christian or calls himself a Christian is truly a follower of God. Um, it, it depends on how you're living out your life, how you've given it to him. God's word didn't fail because God still reaches his children of promise, which may or may not be the same as physical Israel. Paul continues by showing that being a descendant of Abraham, who was the father of the Jews, didn't save anyone. Ishmael was just as much from the seed of Abraham as was Isaac. They were both Abraham's sons. But Ishmael was a son according to the flesh, and Isaac was a son according to the promise. If I gave birth to two sons, which I did not, I only gave birth to one, but let's say I did, and one believes in Christ and the other does not, does that make both of them Christians then, children of the promise based on my faith in Jesus? No, not at all, of course not. It isn't based on physical descent. It's not based on who your daddy was or who your mama was. The difference here is the fact that God has made a covenant with the Jews, and he still keeps his covenant. But since Is Ishmael wasn't the child of the promise, does that mean that God didn't bless him? You know, you're like, well, did he just leave him high and dry? Well, if we read uh, Genesis 21, verses 8 through 21, we can see the answer to that. After Isaac was born to the formerly barren Sarah, uh, Sarah saw Ishmael laughing, you know, laughing at her son and, and demanded that Abraham throw out um, Ishmael and his mother Hagar. You can imagine that there was probably no love lost between these two women. Um, even though Sarah, I mean, even though Hagar having a child with Abraham was Sarah's idea, right, she realized really soon that wasn't a good idea. You know, how would she have felt? She's barren. She's old now. In her mind, it's probably too late physically 
to have a child. So she has this brilliant idea for her f husband to go and have a child with her servant, and that's going to be her baby. Sounds great on paper, but in person it wasn't great. Can you imagine doing that for your husband? Hey, honey, go over there and, you know, no, 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 no. There's, there's jealousy, there's strife. The Hagar got a little bit haughty. You know, she thought, well, look at me. I'm, I can have the baby. You cannot. You know, all of these things. So it almost is like Sarah I was looking for a moment. Now I've got my child and you guys get out of here. So what Sarah said to Abraham was cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. She was right, right, that Israel wasn't the heir of promise, but Is Ishmael was still Abraham's son. And Abraham hated that idea. I mean, that's his son. He still loved him. So he takes it to God. And God said, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. So basically, God's authorizing Abraham to follow Sarah's desire in casting out Hagar and Ishmael. But God doesn't leave it there. He goes on to tell Abraham, I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So even though Ishmael wasn't the child of the promise, the covenant promise, God still blessed him. So one son was the heir of God's covenant of salvation, and one son was not. Isaac stands for the children of the promise, and Ishmael stands for the children of the flesh. So we can see from this example that God's choice is not on the basis of human connection. Right? Both of the sons were children of God's chosen man, Abraham. So let's look at the last verses for tonight's session, starting with verse 10. And not only so, but also, when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told that un the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So Paul's already shown that, that God's choice isn't based on heritage or to whom a person is born, right? But in this example, he's showing us that God's choice is not based on what a person does or on his works or on his own merit. God chose Jacob before he was ever born. God's choice of Isaac over Ishmael might seem logical to us, right? I mean, God had promised Abraham all along that he would have a son and that he would take care of it and it would be through Sarah. Um, and the reason there was even an Ishmael in the first place was because of Sarah and Abraham running ahead of God and trying to help him speed things up. Ever do that? No. We don't, we don't do that anymore, do we? I mean, sometimes we do. We try to run ahead. We might get an idea. We think God's called us to something, and it's not happening in the time that we think. So we've got a plan that we're just going to help him out. Take, take a page out of Sarah's book. Not the best idea. But it would be natural then for us to assume that the child that was you know, born out of wedlock, basically, would have a lesser chance of being the child of the promise. But in this next example, we have a different scenario. We have two sons born to the same father and mother. They're both son of, sons of Isaac. Remember, Isaac was the son of promise. So there was nothing unseemly about the conception, yet God chooses one over the other while they're still in their mother's womb. They haven't even done anything, good or bad. Not only that, but God doesn't make what we would see as the logical choice of choosing the older of the two. Um, to those of you who don't have twins in your family or are not around twins a whole lot, you might not think about birth order being that big of a deal. You know, I mean, they have the same birthday, they're the same age, they might be a minute or two apart, but any set of twins that you know, they know exactly which one of them is older, and most of them know by exactly how many minutes. So it is still a big deal, even if you're twins, even if you're born on the same day. So humanly speaking and biblically speaking, the majority of the family inheritance would go to the firstborn, the firstborn son, as, as a blessing from the father. So God seems to have broken the rules. What did he do? He chose Jacob over Esau. Jacob wasn't the older, right? He was the younger of the two. And so you might say, well, you know, God knew what Esau was going to be like. You know, Jacob would probably be better fit, and God knew that all along. I mean, Esau is the one who gave up his birthright for a bowl of stew, but the truth is, Jacob was no more deserving than Esau, right? If you read the story of these two brothers and you had the choice, 
you'd probably chuck both of these boys and try to start over, right? Um, look for someone else. God doesn't choose on the basis of performance or merit. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news for us? Because none of us can say, oh, well, God chose me because I am awesome. You know, not a single one of us can. He chose us because he chose us, right? So why Jacob and not Esau? Why the second and not the oldest? Look again at verse 11. It says, in order that God's purpose of election might continue. It's God's choice. It's God's right to make the choice. He chooses for reasons that are only known to him, known to him but that serve his purposes. Jacob wasn't chosen because of his works. He was chosen in order that God's purpose of election might continue. And aren't you go, well, finally, now we have a great answer for that. Isn't that incredible? No, that's not satisfying at all, is it? They're like, what are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. I don't understand that. Um, we want the answers. We want to know why. You know, why this one? Why not that one? We want to be able to judge the decision and see if it was right. And I'll talk about that a little bit next week. But we want to know, and that's not a very satisfying answer. What do your parents say? You want to go do something, let's say, when you were little. And your parents knew it wasn't a good idea because they're older and they have more experience. And, but they don't really, they don't need to dwell, delve into the whole reason why. And they say, you say, no, you can't do that. And the child says, why, why not? What do you say? Because I said so, right? And that's a horrible answer. Children hate it, and yet that's not their choice. The parent gets the choice. God gets the choice. It's because he said so. Because he's got a bigger picture that we can't see, right? He's got a plan, and things are working out the way, the way he has them laid out. So now look at verse 13. Now, if you read it out of context, you might think, well, that's rude, you know? One, one way you can look at this is one I loved and the one I hated is in the way of comparison, like is in loved less, you know? But there's other examples of love and hate um, that way in, in God's word. So think about in Matthew um, chapter 6 on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God in money. So he's doing a comparison, right? Or in Luke 14, 26, Jesus says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. It's a comparison, right? He doesn't really want you to hate your mama, does he? Of course not. But he's comparing. He's just saying, in comparison, it's going to seem like hate. The, much, the amount that you're going to love me. So that's one way. But if we look at, look at it in regarding God's purpose and choosing one to become the heir and, of the covenant, God's preference could be seen as a display of love toward Jacob and hate toward Esau. It could be a, a choice. I chose this one. That's showing my love for him. Even though I, I don't hate him, hate him, the way we think of it, I've chosen this one. I've not chosen this one. And so it could be a different kind of comparison. Now, the verse begins with, as it is written. So, as it is written, where? It was written in Malachi, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. It was written a thousand years after the birth of Jacob and Esau. Um, Skip Heisig explains that it isn't specifically speaking about individuals, but of two nations. From Jacob came the nation of Israel. From Esau came the nation of Edom. The nation of Edom hated the worship of God. They hated the nation of Israel. They were sworn is enemies of Israel. So Malachi is speaking of national election, not personal election. So that's another explanation. To be honest with you, this is a, different, a difficult verse, isn't it? It's a difficult verse to wrap your mind around. And I'm not going to stand here and tell you I know exactly the whole thing. I'm just telling you the options of things that I've studied. Um, a woman once said to Charles Spurgeon, I cannot understand why God should say that he hated Esau. That, Spurgeon replied, is not my difficulty, madam. My trouble is to understand how God could love Jacob. Right? And I, I, just, I just get that part because do you ever think, well, why, why me? You know, that's the difficulty. How can you choose? How did God choose me? It's certainly not my merit. It's certainly not my heritage. But for God's reasons, he did. And for that, we should be eternal eternally grateful and so thankful for that. David Guzik said, our greatest error in considering the choices of God is to think that God chooses for arbitrary reasons, as if he chooses in an eeny, meeny, miny, mo way, 
We might not be able to fathom God's reason for choosing and their reasons he alone knows and answers to, but God's choices are not capricious. He has a plan and a reason. So it's easy for us to look at that. That's not, that's not fair. You know, how does he, that, nobody's explained it to me. Why him and not him? But the question should really be, why any of us? Why any of us? We were born into sin. When we sin, because we're sinners, right? But Christ died for the ungodly. And if you've put your faith and your trust in Jesus for salvation and redemption, you've been chosen. Now, next week, we're going to finish up the chapter, chapter 9 of Romans. And so today, we looked at uh, election. And next, we're going to look a little bit more at that, but also at man's responsibility. So I hope that you'll come back next week to discuss the rest of the chapter. It's a difficult chapter. It has been difficult for me. I've been studying it for a while, and it's still difficult but it's a good chapter. So I'm going to pray after that, and then what we're probably going to do is just go sit at one table and and talk about the questions. So let me pray for us. Father, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, I thank you that you are sovereign. And Father, um, I know that it's okay if we don't understand everything because we know that you are good and you are love, and we can trust you. Thank you for your mercy, and thank you for your grace that's, that's chose any of us. Father, I just thank you so much for what Jesus has done for each one of us to make a relationship possible. Father, I thank you for those who are here tonight and and those who may be watching on video. Father, I just pray I'm a blessing on all of them. Lord, we love you and we are grateful to be your daughters. It's in your name I pray. Amen.